Uh, I'd like to welcome you, David Olson, and uh, you're going to talk to us about to serve. Please come forward. We are happy that you are here, and give him a big hand. Well, I am very thankful to be able to be here. And uh, my wife, Shelley, is in the front row here, and I'm very glad that she can travel with me. And tonight you'll hear Ephraim Smith and his wife, Denisha, is here. Ephraim is quite a bit younger than I am, but he was my pastor in Minneapolis until a few years ago when he became the superintendent of beautiful California and a couple of other states. And so I have listened to lots and lots of sermons of Ephraim, and he's a wonderful speaker, and you will enjoy that a lot. And also so glad that Don Ingebrigtsen is able to be with us as well. Um, I was asked to speak on the subject of to serve. And just before I do that, I want to let you know that the connection I obviously have with this group is I'm connected most of all with the Swedish Covenant Church that now is a part of the new group, which in English I've heard is Joint Future, right? <laughs> joint Future. And um, so occasionally I will accidentally lapse into the Swedish Covenant Church because it's ingrained in my mind. And I just want to warn you that, but you'll be happy to know that I was born in a family that was part of the Swedish Baptists. So, you know, I can connect at least two out of the three, and I'm going to leave Ephraim to tell you that he can even do better than me, but you'll just have to wait and see on that one. So I want to do something very simple this afternoon. I want to read some passages of Scripture, three different ones, that can help us to think about what it means to serve. And then I've got two stories I want to tell you that will illustrate that. And that's it. So, if you can listen carefully to the first scripture, it's Mark chapter 9, verse 35. Sitting down, Jesus called the twelve and said, Anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. Anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. There was a man about 125 years ago, and his name was Axel Carlson. Have you ever heard of Axel Carlson? Anybody here? Now, where do you think Axel may have come from? <laughs> okay. He came from Sweden. He actually was sent by the Swedish Covenant Church. But some of you may know this story better than I, but I do know for some reason, because Sweden is so far north, that there was a lot of interest in the gospel going to Russia, and particularly the eastern part of Russia by Siberia. So uh, in the 1880s, he moved to Russia, and he lived there for a while, and he really wanted to preach the gospel in Siberia, so when he got to Siberia, guess how he was welcomed? They put him in prison for three years. Now, when you get out of prison for that, do you probably want to stay around and hang out with the brothers and sisters in Siberia? Probably not. So he ended up taking a boat to San Francisco, and he learned English, and then he took another boat up to Alaska. Now, Alaska is an amazing state of America. It did not become an official state until 1961. It is like two or three times bigger than the next biggest state, Texas. And it's a little cold in Alaska. We would be wearing swimming trunks and t-shirts here if it was in comparison to the weather in Alaska. It's much, much colder there than here. And so what happened was after being in San Francisco, he took this ship and brought him to Western Alaska. It's sometimes called Bush Alaska because 
the trees don't grow very tall. They're very short, so everything looks like a large bush there. And he was dropped off in a village called Unilaclete. And then guess what happened? The boat left. That was it. He didn't know any of the language at all. He's dropped off in this small village of about a thousand people, and there he is. But he's sent by the Mission Covenant Church of Sweden to preach the gospel, and he starts doing that. And there was an Alaska native, which used to be called Eskimos, but now it's Alaska native, and he became a Christian, and his name was Uag Ak, and he ended up was the, the sled driver for Axel Carlson. But when he became a Christian, he got this passion to preach the gospel and ended up being a pretty powerful preacher to his people, sometimes preaching to crowds as large as a thousand, which the largest village is hardly bigger than that. So it's quite an amazing thing. And after a while, another person that became a Christian and this was the third person to become a Christian in the ministry of Axel Carlson. And his name was Stefan Ivanov. And so Stefan would often go with this native, Alaska native uh, person, and they would go to different villages by dog sled and share the gospel. Now, you have to remember Stefan Ivanov, because I'm going to come back to it in a minute. Okay, do you all remember that name? Okay, let me test you. Okay, very good. So what happened is when Alaska became a part of a state of the United States, uh, eventually after about 10 years after that, it became a world mission field because up until then it always was a world mission field. But in 1971, it became part of our department, which back then was called Home Missions. And so I have some responsibility to Alaska and I get to go up there four times a year. So next month, when it's tremendously cold in January 26 and 27, I'll take a plane and after about eight hours, I'll eventually make it up in Alaska. Um, the native population in Alaska, it's a very challenging thing. And it's always in the world it's like this. Whenever an indigenous or native population has to start to live in the Western modern world, what happens to them? It's very difficult. It's very difficult. The cultural uh, orientation and adaptation is enormous. And so in Alaska, there's enormous challenges for native Alaskans. And it exists both in the villages where they often are born, but many times when they're young adults, where do they want to go? They want to go to the big city. And so they go down to Anchorage, which is the biggest city, and they go to Fairbanks, which is the coldest city in the world, in my opinion. And those are the places they go to. And they experience, a, there's a lot of alcohol addiction. Uh, there's an enormous amount of sexual abuse that goes on in families. Their suicide is very prevalent in Alaska Native. All of the villages have satellite television, so the men do pornography, and it's not a very good situation. Well, for 125 years, the covenant has been working in Alaska. We now have 12 churches and villages. We have 10 churches in what's called the road system. And a lot of things have happened. The Covenant has done a really good job on working with Alaska Natives and helping them with education and job opportunities. I think in the whole of the Covenant, and you cannot tell this to anyone in America in the Covenant because the other conferences will not like this, but I think Alaska has the best youth ministry program of any conference in the American Covenant Church. And they have a whole plan for teenagers from age 12 to 25 and how they're gonna develop them as followers of Christ. 
One of the things that came out of this is for a while in that town of Unalakleet, there was a high school and it was very significant, but eventually it ended up having to close. And so in the middle 1990s, it was decided to start something called Alaska Christian College. And what it really is, is it's a college to help Alaska Native young adults when they finish high school to start college in an environment that can be nurturing and helpful to an Alaska Native. And so this year it has about 46 students. I think 43 of them are Alaska Natives. And they are able to learn, study the Bible. They have a counseling center on site that provides about 1,900 counseling visits over the year for these students. So they're able to process some of the challenges they have in their life. It is an amazing thing, a wonderful thing. And just this past year, it got official accreditation by the United States Department of Education that it qualifies as an official two-year college that can transfer its credits to any place, any educational institution in the United States. Um, that's a big part of what has happened there. Another thing that happens in that same town is called the Amundsen Educational Center. I'm gonna read just a little bit here. Our mission, recruit a small group of Alaska Native students from rural Alaska each year, bring them into a village-like Christian campus to live together with a team of mission-minded instructors, enable and equip them to build an entire house together while growing in their faith in Christ, have you ever heard of that? So for one year of college, you actually build a house as you're growing in Christ and provide them with the tools to deal with life's hurts and develop successful life skills. So another amazing thing that they're doing. Now, you remember where this all started, by the way? Don't, don't, go, don't tell me Stefan Ivanov. It was Axel Carlson. It's because one man decided to what? serve, right? Okay, one more thing here. In the Alaska Covenant Youth, because of their youth ministries and educational institutions over the years, in Alaska, it produced the first native medical doctor, the first native lawyer, the first native senator in Congress, and the first native 747 pilot, along with many of our village and road system pastors. Now, what happened about two years ago is the person who was the superintendent of that conference uh, was a retirement age and he retired. And I was to work with a search committee to help find the new one. And so we did a process. We ended up coming up with three candidates. One of the candidates was by far the youngest. He was only 40 years old. In fact, he might have been 39. And in Alaska, elder is a big deal. When you're young, you don't have much authority. It's an elder-based culture there. And so as they were looking at this, these three, they really liked the younger leader, but it was really hard. It took two full days of conversations for them to be able to sort out and decide who this was, who they were gonna call. But they ended up calling the younger candidate and his name is Curtis Ivanov, and his great-grandfather was who? Stefan. Stefan Ivanov. And I have to tell you what an amazing thing that was for the Alaska Natives, because this was the first superintendent that was not an Anglo, but was an Alaska Native. And I remember in that group the emotion they felt, and I remember we called up on a conference call with their executive board for them to approve it. And one of the members is a 45 year old Alaska native and had not heard this news. And when he heard that his friend close in age to him was the new leader, you could just hear him weeping on the other side. Now, why did this happen? Because one person decided to accept the call of God and serve. Another scripture is in John chapter 13. So Jesus got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. 
After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Another place, the American Covenant Church and your group has a really strong connection is in mission work around the world. And so our daughter spent two years as a dean of women at something called Covenant Bible College in Ecuador, and obviously the American Covenant and the Mission Covenant Church, your new group now obviously, has a very important mission field in Ecuador. But the other place that's very, very prominent is in the Congo. Now, in the Congo, you have a different province than we have. Your province, is it Brazzaville, is the main city in your province. We have a little bit of a different one. But did you know that Congo is the poorest country in the world? It's the poorest country in the world. And of all of the provinces, you'll be happy to know you are not in the poorest province of the poorest country of the world. Guess who's there? That actually was given to the American Covenant Church. But it's really fascinating because God has done some amazing things. The Covenant has been there for 75 years. It has an indigenous, wonderful church, great leaders. There's 1,600 churches. They have um, five hospitals, 90 medical clinics, a school system serving 60,000 students, a lot of micro-enterprise projects. It's the largest Covenant denomination in any country in the world is in Congo. And add the part you work in, and it's even bigger than that. It's an amazing story. But having said this, Congo is the poorest country in the world, and the Equator province is the poorest province in the poorest country in the world. And part of what goes on there is a lot of children die when they don't have to die. And they die from Malaria, they die from being malnourished. It's a very, very difficult place to live. And the president of the covenant was meeting at one of our large churches about a year and a half ago and was trying to think about how do we help them get more connected to the mission of the covenant. And God placed this idea in his mind that I wonder if we can do something in Congo that churches like this might feel a connection with. Now, this church happened to have a really strong connection with an organization called World Vision. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, but it's one of the largest Christian development organizations in the world. And so the conversation started, and the American Covenant Church has committed to try to get 10,000 child sponsorships for children in Congo. Now, the way World Vision works it all out is it's not enough to have a child sponsorship. I imagine a lot of us in this room already sponsor a child somewhere in the world. But they are really concerned that they are able to help the whole villages do really well. And so you can't just help a child you really have to help the whole community. And so World Vision is committed to that. We're about three or four months down the road in trying to develop these church, uh, people in churches that say, yes, I want to be a child sponsor. And uh, we're about a third of the way there. I think we have about three and a half thousand. So we've got quite a bit of ways to go, but it still is a good start. So I was up in Alaska um, a couple of weeks ago, and we have a brand new church in the largest city, Anchorage. And it was maybe two months old at that time. And they did what was called, what we call a Hope Sunday. The Hope Sunday is a Sunday focused on inviting people to become a child sponsor of one of these children in the Congo. And after the service, people could go to a table and 
pick up a card that had the picture of the child and some biography on the child and that sort of thing and could adopt that child. So about 15 families had picked up the cards. They had received 20 because it's just a brand new church. And there were five left. And I stood at the table and I read the names and I looked at the pictures. And one of them stood out to me. His name was Je Dunn. Now, I took some French in high school and I knew what that meant. God gives. And I looked into his eyes in the picture and I knew God was saying to me, I am giving Je Dunn to your family, to you to serve so he can live a better life. Let me tell you one last verse. It's a very short one, a very important one in Scripture. Mark 10, 45. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. I, I'd like you to think this afternoon about when God calls you to serve, you may actually be doing something parallel to what Jesus was called to do. I want you to think that it might be possible for us through serving to give our life as a ransom for someone else, okay? So what Jesus was saying here is all of us, we did not come into this world to be served, but what? To serve and to give our lives as a ransom for many. To serve means I give up my life to let others experience true life. And God takes these little acts of service that we do, and over time, I think he creates a miracle of God, something that is far bigger than we can ever imagine. When Axel Carlson got dropped off on the village and the fishing or the boat left and he was by himself, do you think he had any idea what God is doing in Alaska right now? I don't think so. But he was faithful and said, I'm called by God. I am ready to serve. Um, in Congo, when the missionaries from Sweden went, when the missionaries from America went, when the church is bigger than the churches in Sweden and America, we're amazed. Those sacrificial acts of servants who said, yes, Lord, I want to serve, God took and he created a miracle. And I think that's what the calling is. God is saying, do not be a person who's here to be served, but come to serve and give your life as a ransom for many. Amen.